uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for these uh, kind introductions. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today uh, and to be able to talk about a tricky problem that we, as uh, scholars of the past, you might say, know all too well. So the loss of cultural artifacts. So when we look back at history, it's a bit like trying to complete the jigsaw puzzle with many pieces missing. Um, over time, countless historical records, artifacts and narratives have been lost, leaving us with an incomplete picture of the past. Now, these lost pieces of history aren't just individual tragedies, you might say, but they represent the collective distortion uh, of our past. And I kind of like the, the, um, the metaphor of listening to a symphony, but with a portion of the instruments missing. So we might still enjoy the music, but we're not hearing the full richness or complexity of that composition. And uh, our understanding of societies and their history is similarly muted without those lost narratives and, and artifacts. Now, that's an immense challenge actually in the humanities. Uh, and surprisingly, not that that much has been done uh, quantitatively. Um, now, fortunately, um, we're not completely helpless here. So today we want to present research uh, for which we've drawn inspiration from a perhaps somewhat unexpected quarter, namely ecology. And specifically, um, we borrowed a powerful tool, which is known as the unseen species model. And what we want to do is, is show and test the, the applicability of this model to cultural data. So ecologists um, use this model to estimate the number of species in an area that haven't been identified yet. So imagine you're a biologist studying the biodiversity in a particular forest. So over several weeks, you've managed to observe and catalog a variety of animal species that live within a particular bounding box. So the, the square here on, on the slide. But you suspect that there are species in the forest that you haven't seen yet. So how can you estimate how many unseen species there might be? Now, unseen species models can help here, and specifically the Chow-1 estimator developed by N. Chow in 1984. So what do you do? Well, you begin with the data that you've collected, specifically looking at the, the, the species you've only seen once, and we call those species as singletons. And you also look at the species you've only seen twice, and those we call doubletons. So let's say in your study, um, you found 10 uh, uh, singletons and, and five doubletons. So the, the, the Chow-1 estimator then uses a very simple formula. So the, uh, the number of unseen species is estimated as the number of singletons squared divided by two times the number of doubletons. So in our case, uh, the number of unseen species would be estimated as uh, 100 divided by 10 equals 10. So what does it mean? Well, based on the data that you've collected, um, you can estimate that there are approximately 10 species in the forest that you haven't observed yet. It's worth noting, or actually it's very important to note, uh, that this is a lower bound estimate. And that means that the actual number could be higher, but it is unlikely that it will be lower. Hmm. Now, that Simple method um, allows researchers to estimate the richness of biodiversity in a given area, even when they can't observe uh, every species. And similarly, scholars of the past can use these unseen species models to estimate the amount of historical or social data that might still be hidden from view. So we will illustrate today the versatility of the unseen species model based on three diverse case studies. And our first stop is medieval Europe, uh, where we delve into chivalric narratives such as the tales of King Arthur. And here the unseen species model serves as a tool for what you might call literary archaeology. So we use it to estimate the possible number of lost narratives based on those that have uh, survived. And the model helps us balance the known tales with an estimate of the unknown. So providing a broader perspective on the narrative landscape during this period. Um, and next, we board, you might say, the ships of the Dutch East India Company. And, and here, the unseen species model shifts from being a tool uh, for literary archaeology or archaeology to a method for demographic analysis. And in this case, we apply the model to the ledgers of seafarer contracts. And the goal here 
is very similar, but here we try to estimate the real number of unique seafarers considering the records that have survived. And we also try to infer the magnitude of those that are missing. And this approach then allows us to create a more accurate picture of the maritime workforce during this era. Now, and finally, uh, we arrive at the Amico prison in 19th century Brussels. Uh, and here, the unseen species model plays a role in historical criminology, helping us to decode biases and disparities in, in, in arrest records. And we use the model to estimate the dark number of unapprehended perpetrators. And in doing so, we aim to uncover intersectional biases that might have skewed the original data. And the, uh, the approach, again, helps us to draw a more accurate demographic representation uh, of the period and filling in gaps and correcting potential inaccuracies. And now Mike is going to present the first case study, which will be about uh, forgotten books. Hi, so the um, first application of unseen species models to cultural data that I'm going to discuss today is about medieval European literature. This literature was roughly produced before the, the advent of movable type printing in Europe from the 15th century onwards. And in this period, roughly speaking from the 11th to the 15th century, handwritten documents or what we call manuscripts were the, the primary means to sustainably store and transmit um, text. What we have worked with is longer form narrative fiction. Um, so no shorter stuff like lyrical uh, songs or poems, etc. We actually focused on uh, a genre, you could say, that we called heroic and chivalric narratives. And I think that the, the well-known stories about King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table uh, are probably the most well-known example. And they were also uh, a hall hallmark of uh, the international uh, courtly culture of the time. Apart from these international genres and fashions, you could say, like the Arthurian romance, we also considered more local indigenous traditions, like, for instance, the French uh, Chanson de Geste or the Icelandic sagas. If you don't know this kind of literature, I'd say that the best present day equivalent that we have are action movies. So this comes very close to the sort of literature that we have been uh, looking at. Um, much of this literature has been lost over time, has been forgotten over time. But nevertheless, what we still often have are multiple parallel copies um, of these works, these medieval works that often uh, survive as fragments nowadays. You can see a couple of examples to the, the right there. And what we see is that especially popular stuff, popular works circulated in, in more than one copy so that the number of surviving copies in medieval studies is often seen as a proxy for the, the popularity uh, the contemporary popularity of a work in the Middle Ages. Now, in our work, we make a very firm distinction between, on the one hand, the abstract or immaterial work um, and the material documents, copies, witnesses, uh, in which the same document then has been uh, recorded, has been copied. And important for what follows is that we therefore have multiple sightings, you could say, of the same medieval work, just as these ecologists, as Folbert uh, explained, have uh, multiple observations for the same animal species. And this is something that we call abundance data. We will base our work on, on these counts that we have for these works, the number of copies that we have per medieval work. So in many cases, what we see is that a work once existed in at least one copy, but nowadays no copies of that work survive any longer. So we don't know the work anymore, which is a direct result of the material loss of artifacts of these manuscripts. And uh, such works are what we call um, forgotten works or lost works. Um, so what we have done is we've applied an unseen species model to a corpus of medieval literature and with a team of international collaborators across Europe. We collected count data for these medieval works and manuscripts, and we did that for six European vernaculars. So we consider three uh, continental literatures, so medieval Dutch, German, and French. And we also looked at three island literatures or insular literatures, English, Icelandic, and uh, Irish. And this was a pretty difficult task um, because in these uh, unseen species models, we are primarily uh, concerned with works that don't have a lot of copies. Remember, F1 and F2, singletons and doubletons. So the 
the rare stuff, you could say. Typically in medieval studies, there's more attention for works that have a lot of copies, but here what you need is reliable information on low frequency works. And establishing these counts actually requires quite a bit of philological precision. So because of that, we try to work as much as possible with pre-existing resources or repertories of medieval literature, like the, the German Handschriften uh, census. Um, and these resources catalog medieval literature as it survives nowadays in hadn't written sources. Uh, and we restricted ourselves to the period before the introduction of the printing press uh, in the respective areas that we um, considered. And this was a very rewarding exercise in itself because it's actually a pretty uncommon, unusual way of looking at um, medieval literature. Um, so, as I said, for our medieval data, it's very important to separate out two things. First of all, the loss of the immaterial works, which are something abstract. And then, on the other hand, the loss of material, tangible uh, documents. And of course, the loss of works results from the loss of uh, documents. So when it comes to the loss of works in medieval literature, there has been very little uh, prior quantitative uh, work on which we could base ourselves. This was a bit blue sky research, you could say. So the only faint indications that we sometimes have is that sometimes authors in their own works refer to works um, that they wrote, but which we don't know anymore. Um, but this happens only rarely, and the counts that you get from, from this information must be a very severe underestimation of the number of lost uh, works. And this is interesting because the, the number of lost works from medieval literature is actually one of the I would say major outstanding uh, issues that we have in uh, medieval philology. So now we turn to these unseen species models. We apply the CHA1 estimator to see, to find out how many works potentially minimally um, might have been uh, lost. And what you can see here are the main results that we have for the union of our six corpora. So uh, basically the sum of all the counts that we had in all the six uh, languages. And we collected count data for 799 works. These are the immaterial things. <coughs> and together, these works survive in 3,648 documents, witnesses that we still have. Now, if you take the F1 and F2 from this collection, number of singletons, number of doubletons, um, you can apply Chow. And in terms of survival ratio, uh, we estimate that 371 works were forgotten. On this literature do not survive anymore, which would imply that about 68% of these works um, survived. You can actually visualize that in the kind of curve that you see here, a species accumulation curve. And what you can see is a blue line where we plot the number of works on the vertical axis as a function of the number of documents on the horizontal axis. And this shows you how many new works you are likely to find as you sample or continue to discover more documents. You have a solid part to the line there, um, to the left, which is the, the situation as we can observe it nowadays. Remember, 799 works. But there's also a dashed part to the line. And that, you could say, that line offers you a peek into the future. So it shows you what would happen if we were to continue finding more manuscripts, even into infinity. And what you can see is that this curve is asymptotic, so it starts to flatten out at a given point. And this level of saturation that you see suggests that there were originally at least about 1170 works, of which nowadays only 68% uh, uh, survives. Um, so that is for the loss of works, but we are also very interested in the loss of material documents. And here we are, in fact, a bit more on solid ground because there has been more empirical work on this topic in the field of book history. And most of this work, interestingly, is based on medieval libraries of which the composition is still known because the catalogues survive of these medieval um, book collections. And simply by tracking how many of these documents still survive, you can indeed fairly easily estimate the loss of documents. And for the Holy Roman Empire in this period, for instance, scholars like Hanno Weismann have estimated a survival rate, and this is an important number, of about 7% for the general population of manuscripts. So of these medieval manuscripts, about 7% would still survive today. This is for the general population. What you see is that for more expensive 
illustrated books, higher end books, you're probably looking at a higher estimate. We could, uh, and there you have a survival rate that might be as high as 20%. There's a couple of caveats here because, first of all, these, these book lists that we still have of medieval uh, libraries are pretty rare overall. And secondly, they come from very privileged, um, highly protected uh, environments like uh, monasteries. And for that reason, we don't always know how well these numbers uh, or how representative these numbers are of other maybe urban uh, collection environments. So in any case, it would be good to be able to corroborate these numbers with using other complementary methods, methods like unseen species models. And that's what we tried. Um, so for tackling this part of the research, we actually used an extension of the uh, Chow method from 2009. And this method was in fact uh, originally meant to inform field workers um, in ecology uh, and try to inform them as to how well they were doing on a, a bioregistration campaign, basically when they could go, go home. So suppose that we've been able to establish F0 or the number of species that we minimally didn't uh, detect yet. What this model tries to estimate is how many additional sightings we would have to do to observe each of these species at least once. And what we argued in our work is that this number can give you an idea of the number of lost manuscripts also. Why? Because basically we can assume that most medieval works must have circulated in very low uh, numbers anyways, especially for the, the works that don't survive uh, anymore. And our reasoning here is that if you've seen every work at least once, this probably implies that you've also seen most um, documents. So simply put, what is the question here? How many more manuscripts, how many more documents would we have to discover from this genre uh, in order to have seen all works at least once? And basically, as you can see in the figure here, what we're trying to estimate is the point in the curve where the species accumulation starts to flatten out. So when does the asymptote kick in? Um, and uh, this extension um, allows you to estimate that point. And uh, the blue blob that you can see in the graph there to the right shows the distribution for the estimate of the original number of documents that once existed. And as shown by the vertical line, this method would suggest, would estimate, that originally there were just over 40,000 manuscripts containing this kind of chivalric and uh, heroic narratives from the medieval period. And of these then, only 9% would survive. And what is very interesting is that when this number came out, I, I still remember I was very surprised because, of course, here we have a number that is very much in the same ballpark as the 7% that both historians mentioned um, before. And that's very interesting because uh, our method out of the blue, you could say, and although it used a completely different data source, gives you an estimate that is very much in the same range as what um, book historians put forward um, before. So now I quickly return to the, the loss of uh, works um, where we had a survival rate of 68%, uh, which actually uh, is pretty high. So uh, intuitively, I would say that that is a high number. Doesn't sound that bad, you could say. But these results are for the, the union of the corpora. And perhaps these numbers are a bit misleading because they're very much biased towards the larger literatures, especially German literature. And if you calculate these survival rates separately, in fact, you notice that there are very outspoken differences across um, the languages. And we also confirmed that using different um, techniques. So overall, these uh, results confirm the severity of um, the loss. But what you also see is that there's really substantial differences across the different vernaculars that we uh, considered. And what we found especially striking is that two of these smaller island literatures, so Irish and Icelandic, in fact had a relatively high um, survival in comparison to some of, her, of their larger continental counterparts. And we found that very interesting. And um, English, on the other hand, what you see had a very low um, survival rate for works and documents. And there you can maybe question whether England really was uh, an island at the time because the channel was so easily crossed already in uh, medieval times. So as to why Icelandic and Irish are so well preserved, uh, as it would seem, I'm going to refer you to our paper where we discuss a number of uh, possible uh, explanations, but uh, they would lead a bit too far um, today. I'm going to hand over to Folgert now. Thank you, Mike. 
so some lessons learned. Um, so so the, the medieval literature was our first application um, of unseen species models to cultural data. So what are the what are some of the lessons we learned from this first application? Well, well, first, the, the application uh, was already interesting is, is relatively straightforward and you don't require much data other than just abundance data, just 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 count data, right? Um, and we also know that the estimates were, were fairly robust uh, in the face of slight differences in our sample. So we had a lot of discussion about what to include as chivalric literature in these, in these langu languages, but the inclusion or exclusion of, of some specific works or documents uh, only barely altered the results. Now, thirdly, um, assessing whether the, the, the estimations make any sense is, is actually quite hard because uh, we just don't know. You can find some corroborating uh, evidence, but in the end, you just don't really know. Um, but an important ingredient in the assessment is the uh, in, in the in the assessment of the trustworthiness of the results is to what extent the historical sampling process corresponds to the assumptions of the model, because the model has been studied uh, intensely in the past. What is it? Uh, Forty years already. Um, and if these assumptions hold, the Chao one estimator guarantees to provide a lower bound on the actual number of species. And that's, of course, very useful information to have if we actually have such a uh, guarantee. But if they don't, so if the assumptions do not hold, we might be in trouble. Um, and that's the topic of our next case study, which is about unseen sailors in the Dutch East India Company. So. The applicability of uh, the Chao one model depends on a number of assumptions, and one crucial assumption is related to the way the ecological data are typically collected. So going back to this, this little animation that I showed you earlier, um, when an ecologist does a census in a particular area, um, she or he may observe the same animal, so that is the, the, the same individual, several times. And that repeated observation forms the basis uh, for the calculation of Chao Wang. So in other words, it assumes samples to be formed with replacement. And important to the underlying assumption of the model is that as long as the ecologist sits for long enough, and, and also that the observed animals live long enough, um, the researcher can, in principle, make an infinite number of observations. So again and again, certain animals are spotted. So. In other words, you could say that the, the Chao one estimator assumes what we call an infinite population. Now, the question is whether cultural historical archives are also formed with replacement. Um, are they also drawn from an infinite population? And most often they are not, since particular individual artifacts are only observed once and then put into a collection. Um, and this is very similar to the situation in ecology in, in what they call uh, trap surveys. So in these surveys, individuals such as insects are killed when they are sampled. Um, so they cannot be repeatedly observed, while Chao one actually assumes that they do. And it's very crucial that, that violating this, this assumption potentially renders the estimates completely unreliable. So we want to illustrate this by means of a case study, which is about the Dutch East India Company. And the Dutch East India Company was founded in 1602, and it was a very powerful and influential trading company in the Netherlands that played a significant role in the Dutch colonial expansion. Um, now here we focus on the size of the company in, in terms of the number of seafarers employed uh, by the company. So the company kept detailed records of their employees, and many of which survived, but also many have been lost. So as such, we do, do not know whether we uh, can have a credible estimate of the number of unique individuals that were hired by the company. And the simple goal of this study was to estimate the real number of unique seafarers, considering the records that have survived. And as I will show shortly, this requires a small adaptation of Chao one to deal with data that was sampled without uh, replacement. So let's first have a quick look at the data that we use for this study. So we make use of uh, two uh, sources. And the first one is, is called VOC Careers, or VOPAR for short, and it contains over 700,000 digitized contracts that were issued between 1633 and 1795. So the contracts specify a lot of things, uh, so like the name, rank, place of birth of the contract treaty, and, and, and the date of sailing, uh, and, and also the ship 
uh, on which they uh, sailed. So the original let ledgers could contain multiple contracts belonging to the same person, right? And that's important because then we have multiple sightings of the same person. Um, and these, these, these records then have been uh, automatically clustered on unique individuals, and that allows us to trace the same person in that data. Now, that clustering isn't complete. So only about 500,000 records could be clustered. And, and that set contains uh, around 460,000 unique seafarers. So on the slide here, uh, you can see an overview of the, of the clustered uh, results. So we, we, we see a sharp increase in the, in the 17th century and also notable gaps right, uh, in the 18th century. So just by looking at the graph, um, we can already infer that data is missing. It must be missing from this digitized archive. Um, but also that we haven't been able to cluster all the individuals and therefore we likely underestimate the number of unique persons. Now, uh, as a complementary data set, uh, we use the Dutch Asiatic shipping data set, and that provides an overview of, of ships that sailed out from, uh, from the Dutch Republic. And from this data, we learned that the VOC sailed out 4,352 times. We know that we have a very exact number for that between 1633 and 1795. And for about 91% of these voyages, uh, the data set provides information uh, on the number of people that boarded uh, the vessel. Now, recall that the Chao Wang assumes data to be sampled with replacement and that they come from an infinite population, right? Now, our data um, is different and it's different in an important way. So, in our case, too, we have repeated observations of individuals, but and that's actually crucial, that repetition is not potentially infinite. So as such, we were dealing with a finite population and, and the, the log files of the East India Company hold a sample of that finite uh, population. So that the difference between finite and infinite populations is key, um, just like knowing whether your data is formed with or without replacement. Because if we apply Chow one to data samples without replacement, it can greatly overestimate the true number of unseen things. And, and the, the estimates become very much unreliable. So I will come back to this when we are discussing the results. So what can we do? Well, we can look at a better fit to our data, and that's an extension of the Chow one method. It was also specifically developed for these kind of data. So as in the original Chow one model, uh, we need information about the number of items that occur once, and also the number of items that occur twice. Now, the difference between the extension and the Chow one method is that the extension requires some uh, uh, additional information, which is about the size of the total population. Now, several logbooks um, have disappeared, uh, so we don't have that information, um, but we can actually make a very reasonable estimate. So how do we do it? Well, simply put, we, we estimate the, the total population, let's call that M, by taking the mean number of sailors from all known ships and multiplying that by the number of voyages of the East India Company, for which we have a very exact number, right? So we know the total number of voyages, we just don't know how many people were involved with each of them. So that, that number, that N, uh, the total population, might not be precisely accurate, but it gives us a relatively good and, and robust estimate of the total population. So the application of this extension of the model um, yielded the following uh, main results and insights. So first, the, the, the model estimates that at least 36% of the individuals employed by the East India Company are unseen, or uh, conversely, the, the survival rate is around 64%. And additionally, um, we, we see large differences uh, in, in, in the survival rates over time. So the plot here shows that far fewer individuals are known from the early years. And, and so the survival rate is much lower. And the difference in this period between observed and, and, and estimated ranges uh, between 45% in, in, in 1683 uh, to as high as 96% between 1633 and 1658. So quite uh, some severe loss here. Now, finally, the model estimates that around 700,000 individuals were employed by the company. Um, so this number is much more conser conservative than the estimate of, of, of the Chao One model that actually estimates that there must have been more than 2 million employees. 
And, and that's kind of funny because that, that number is obviously wrong because that would mean that, that the number of individuals is many times la larger than the total number of observations. And it simply cannot be true. So um, some more lessons learned. Um, our results provide a concrete answer to the question of, of how large the East India Company was. And in addition, the study has as relevance because it shows how important it is to have knowledge about the sampling process that underlies your data when you want to apply these uh, unseen species models. And the lesson here is that a wrong assumption can lead to well, completely implaus implausible or even impossible uh, results. Now, for our data, we are fortunate to be able uh, to provide a relatively reliable estimate of this n, so we can, in fact, apply this other method. But it's by no means the case for all historical databases. So for future work, we want to investigate the impact um, of uncertainty about n on the quality of these estimates. Um, and we also want to investigate how adding information about the records can further improve the quality of the estimates. And that's also going to be the topic of, of the final case study that we want to present. So the applicability of, of the Chao one estimator hinges on the number of, of issues, and, and, there, and there are more issues. Um, and we're going to present one more. Uh, and an interesting assumption here is that all these unseen species or cultural artifacts uh, are assumed to be equally likely to be observed. Uh, so, or differently, differently put, so the, the total probability of unseen events is distributed equally over all individual events. Now, when that assumption doesn't hold, so when, when certain artifacts are actually more or less likely to be observed, the, the estimates of, of Chao Wang become more conservative. So they go down, essentially. They, they become, be, become more of a lower bound. Now, that's actually not much of a problem because they're still a lower bound, so that's still reliable information. We could actually more see it as, as an opportunity. Um, so if we have more information about the causes of why some artifacts are more likely than others, we can potentially use that information to, to, uh, to actually make our estimates less conservative. So, so moving that, that estimate more towards the, the, the true number. And that's um, what, uh, in, in, uh, what uh, uh, the scholar Bunning has done with his team in a series of articles. Um, they show how you can, um, can add information about covariates, so certain characteristics of animal species, to your model. And, they, and how adding these, uh, these covariates can help improve the Chao uh, one estimator. And the critical insight here is, is understanding the, the context of the data. So with Chao one uh, we're only considering singletons and doubletons, right? So the F1 and the F2. So you might say that we're, that we're working with what we call a truncated Poisson distribution. So I'm not going to go into detail any, um, but that distribution has as one parameter. It's, it's called lambda. Um, and that actually can be estimated with a binomial likelihood. So instead of the usual hats and tails, here we're dealing with two rather different outcomes, namely F1 and F2. So those are our negative and positive classes. Um, and with this approach, we can estimate the, the probability of an event occurring once or twice. And we can do that using generalized linear models. Um, and that's where it gets particularly interesting. So with these linear models, you can easily incorporate all kinds of uh, covariates, right? You can just use binomial regression models, any flavor that you like and add all kinds of predictors like we can add the rank or country of the or country of origin of the of the seafarers uh, to study biases in the registration um, or we could add particular information about the content of narratives are they about love or some other topic to see whether that influences their chances of survival and by incorporating these covariates we aim to account for some of the heterogeneity in the data so not all uh, artifacts are equally likely uh, to be observed. And in doing that, we hope to improve our estimates. And in the final case study that Mike is going to present, um, we do that and we apply that to a case of historical criminology. Okay, so uh, more specifically, we're um, going to Brussels in the 19th century. That's the city where I was raised, where I still live. And we're going to focus on a, a prison that is called the Amigo prison which is nowadays a very nice place because it's a five-star luxury hotel and Brad Pitt is always staying there when he's visiting Brussels, but it used to be a uh, prison. 
And um, we've collaborated with Margot de Koster from the University of Kent, who is a police historian, to study one of the registers that they have for this prison from the period um, 1879 to 1880, which is a register of vagrants or homeless people, people who didn't have a place to stay. Uh, um, vagabondage, as they call it in French, was a huge issue um, at the time. And um, people were often um, arrested in that prison for reasons of vagabondage, for being a vagrant. And our goal in this study is to estimate the total population size of vagrants in Brussels at that time um, on the basis of the vagrants who were observed in um, those um, arrest registers that we are um, studying. What is nice is that those records include a lot of very detailed demographic information on the people who were arrested and had to spend the night in the uh, prison. We have their age, we have their gender, we even know where they were born, uh, etc. And uh, interestingly, there's actually two kinds of people who were in the prison. So there were people who uh, were arrested by the police and then forcefully entered the prison. But at the time, the police also had a more social function and people could also request to spend the night in the prison because they didn't find a uh, place to stay. And that's what we call une nuit sur demande, uh, where people actually request to stay a night in the um, uh, prison. So we will focus on the uh, forceful uh, entering of the uh, prison here. Um, so what is interesting is that most of our people only were registered in this prison um, a single time, but we see quite a bit of recidivism, where you see that these, the same individual is being arrested multiple times more than, than once. And uh, what we do, we study a very short um, time uh, period, which is interesting because then we can also use the age um, of the individuals as a, fi a fixed characteristic uh, that doesn't change over time. And that's important because that assumption uh, simplifies uh, our model and also assumes that the population that we are studying um, stays pretty much uh, the same. Um, it's also important to note that people didn't spend a lot of time in a prison. So when they were arrested, they typically only had to spend one night um, in that uh, prison. So that in principle, the day after, um, uh, they could reappear, they could be recited in this um, um, prison register. So in essence here, we're delving into a unique uh, snapshot of historical prison data. And uh, what is very cool is that Folger found a, an ancestor of mine in the data set, uh, Marie-Thérèse uh, Kestemont, who must be family of me and who was arrested uh, a number of times for this um, uh, transgression of vagabond, vagabondage. So that was uh, somewhat funny, also somewhat uh, tragic. Um, so we applied this generalized Chow estimator that Folger just explained to answer two research questions. So first of all, um, we wanted to estimate the number of people who were not caught or uh, arrested. And this is what we call the dark number of perpetrators of vagrants um, here. Dark number is a very common term in uh, criminology um, to describe unobserved uh, crime. And then secondly, what we want to understand is how um, likely different categories of perpetrators were to get um, arrested. And that should give us a clearer pic a picture into the vulnerability um, to arrest across different demographic um, groups in Brussels at that uh, time. So here you can see an um, example of the um, uh, register that uh, has been digitized by uh, Margot. We have the names and all the predictors that we use in our model to predict whether somebody is going to be a singleton or a double ton. It's in fact a really hard uh, problem, but using these uh, characteristics that you see here, we try to predict whether somebody is going to get arrested once or arrested twice. We look at the uh, age logged. We look at the uh, binary sex uh, coding of the individual. We look at their place of birth as a categorical variable. We know whether people were born in Brussels, local, in Belgium, but outside Brussels, or whether they were uh, foreigners, whether they were born abroad and then migrated to um, Belgium. There's two additional interesting um, variables here, um, their family name. And here what we're trying to uh, model is whether uh, there exists something like a bias against criminal families. And here we check whether somebody with the same um, last name had been arrested prior to the arrest, uh, the first arrest of an individual, to see whether there was a bias against known criminal 
families in the uh, city. And then uh, one final predictor that we use is the prior predictor, which basically checks if somebody got arrested, whether that person came to the police, uh, the police before that date asking for a uh, nuit sur demande, uh, for a requested night, so to speak. And here the hypothesis was, which is a bit sad, uh, that if people entered um, or requested to spend the night at the prison once, did that uh, increase their probability of getting arrested um, the day after, so to speak. So those are the variables that we use to predict for each individual that we know in this data set, whether they're going to get arrested once or twice. Um, so to estimate these probabilities, we made use of a, a Bayesian uh, framework, a generalized linear model, as implemented in the uh, Python library PyMC, but we use the more uh, high-level interface called Bambi um, to uh, PyMC, which is way more convenient and way easier to uh, code with. Here you can see uh, the model specification and how much shorter it is in Bambi in comparison to the fully explicit uh, PyMC3 um, implementation. So we build various models, including a simple intercept model that doesn't look at any um, predictors, etc. But we are going to focus here on a full covariate model that includes all of the um, predictors that uh, I previously um, discussed. So the main results here, um, what you see here to the right is a so-called forest uh, plot. And it's showing you the highest density interval, or the HDI, for the um, predictors that we included in this model. And the HDI tells us that the probability, that's true value, um, is within a particular interval. In our case, what is interesting is that none of the predictors, in fact, cross zero. None of these ranges that you see um, plotted uh, intersect uh, with zero. And that's interesting. That means that all of the predictors that we are considering contribute something meaningful to um, this model. And here you have uh, negative ranges and positive ranges. And when positive, you see that the likelihood of an F2 is increased. So whenever you have a parameter there that is higher than zero, that means that it's um, more likely to get um, an F2 instead of an uh, F1. Um, so what, what it turns out and this you can see clearly in this plot, is that women are in fact way more likely, generally speaking, to end up as an F2 than men. So there was a, a higher vulnerability to arrest in women than in men, even though the female population was much smaller of vagrants at that time. Age also plays a role in the increasing likelihood of arrest. And you see that older people were more likely to get cited twice instead of once. And also if you were a local vagrant, uh, somebody born in Brussels, uh, chances are you were also more likely to get arrested compared to non-local Belgians or foreigners. And um, what is interesting also, if you had requested to stay in the prison yourself voluntarily one night before, um, that's also more likely, um, um, it becomes more likely that you will be spotted again, but then you will forcefully enter the uh, prison. And then finally, there's also a hint of evidence, this effect is a bit smaller, that people with known last names, so people coming from known criminal families, you could say, um, are indeed perceived as criminals or troublemakers, and they faced more intense scrutiny by the um, police. So this is still just a model that um, tries to separate the F2 cases from the F1 cases. And uh, the cool part about computing these specific model probabilities is that you can use them not just to estimate the number of individuals that you've observed in each group, but you can also estimate the total number of perpetrators that went uh, unnoticed. And what you can see is that we find um, very different uh, arrest rates uh, across these different demographic um, groups. So all in all for the complete population that we are talking about here, you can see that there was uh, a detection ratio of not even one third. So in this data set, we observe a little over 5,500 5, individuals, but we estimate that this uh, population of vagrants that who could potentially be arrested is at least um, 18,514 individuals, which is of course a huge difference. And then for example, what you can see here is that even though there were fewer women uh, than men committing crimes, it turns out that older local 
females were much more likely to be arrested than their, for instance, male younger uh, counterparts. And it's not just them, Belgium nationals, particularly those from Brussels, local people, also seem to be a major focus for the police. On the other hand, it doesn't look like there was a very significant bias against foreigners. We didn't find any evidence for that on the contrary, maybe even. So all in all, these findings, they shed interesting light on the um, patterns in arrest uh, during that time in um, Brussels. Um, so what is the takeaway from all this? Our findings do align really well with what people like Marco have been previously publishing in um, more conventional history uh, platforms. And uh, what they show is that this generalized Chow estimator can be really informative uh, when you're studying um, how observation or survival or transmission processes in history might be biased against certain sources, individuals, what have you. When we're, for instance, trying to estimate these dark numbers um, in relation to police efforts in historical Brussels. And the additional benefit of models to detect these biases is that in theory, the accuracy of your estimates will uh, improve. And this method is pretty general and it could be applied, in fact, to anything countable to any undersampled collection of types. And we have a lot of those in the humanities. So there's still a lot of um, applications um, possible. Um, if we get a bit more critical um, at the end of this presentation, we should stress that every method has its limitations. And, and this study also, this last one on dark numbers, is, is no exception. So one big assumption that we haven't really talked about is the idea of a closed versus an open population. And this Chao one model basically fundamentally assumes that we've got a closed population, a population that doesn't change. Um, with no one coming in or out of Brussels, for instance, where you can observe any individual at any time. Uh, obviously, that's not really the case, so that can't be wholly true, you could say. Some of the people that we are studying will eventually end up behind bars for a longer period, so we can't just observe them any, uh, anymore as, uh, as often as we want. And what we know is that from historical records, people moved around a lot, so there was a huge population turnover in cities at that, mo uh, at that moment, which might be as high as 10% as every year. So the big question here is, is how much breaking these um, model assumptions will in fact uh, affect our results, our estimates. So one thing that we can do about is that we are currently trying is to use simulation models and agent-based models like the one that you see um, um, here. Uh, so these types of models allow you to compare very different scenarios in a very controlled uh, environment, a very controlled setting. So for instance, what we would like to simulate in the in the near future is the search behavior or the, the policing effort by the policemen in Brussels at the time. So um, we know that they weren't just peop uh, picking people at random, there were biases at work there. And that is something that you can actually simulate in a simulation model. So ultimately, the goal of these experiments is to provide historical scholars with some guidelines on whether they can in fact confidently apply uh, these models to their, their own data. Um, so that was it for the presentation. We'd be happy to take questions afterwards. Uh, we were also quickly going to show the um, mode and uh, the model repositories, etc. that we have. Um, Folgert, can you uh, share your screen for that? Uh, I think I can. Uh, let me see. Yeah. No, I lost my own screen. <laughs> we can see it though. All right, there it is. Yeah. Sorry. It was hated. Um, shall I do it, Mike? Or yeah. do you want to? OK. Yeah, so what we wanted to show you is, is, is a package that we created, and, 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 and we published this along with the uh, publication about the forgotten books in, 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 in science. Um, so uh, the package is, is, is called Copia. 
uh, and it essentially provides you a, a lot of these methods that we that we discussed um, in, in, a, in a nice clean format that you that you can actually apply it to your own uh, data. Um, and it's it's on PyPy, so the, the Python package index, so you can easily install it with with pip if if you want to. Um, so pip install copia should do the trick, and I, I think it still works with Python three. 3.11 plus or 3.12, I'm not sure, uh, but you're probably not on that version yet. Um, so what I wanted to do is just go over some some of the of the code that's in this quick start here uh, that allows you to, to see what kind of data you need, what kind of functionality is already in the package, and how what well, essentially how easy it is to to actually apply this 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 uh, this, this model to your data. Um, so we're only going to focus on the the, the simple, quote unquote, simple model, the, the, the Chow one uh, model. Um, so what you always need to do is transform your, um, your, your data that needs to be in some way countable. So you need to have some categories, so to speak, or make it make some categories if you want. So in our case, we had um, you know, works, for example, so we could count the number of Times we see a particular narrative or a particular work, or the number of times you see a particular individual, right? So, so it needs to be countable, and that's how you should transform your data. In the end, the only thing that you need to obtain is is, is an array, something like that, with the frequencies uh, of uh, of the categories that you have. So certain things occur once, and certain things occur twice, and and other things occur many times. And so the Chao one method is in the end only going to look at the thing that occur once or twice, um, but here you just need to create an array of counts. That's the abundance data that you want to make. And there's also a utility function that we created. It's called uh, uh, two abundance. Um, can you read or should I make it a bit the font a bit bigger? Does this help? Okay. Um, Right, so there's this 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 utility function to abundance, and that allows you if if you if if you're lazy, you know, it's it's not that much work, of course, uh, to 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 do that uh, for you. And you get a nice array of these counts, and that's in the end the only thing that you actually need for computing the, these uh, these unseen uh, numbers. Um, now here you have some more utility functions like some of the statistics, and you already get back the the uh, the F ones and the F twos and F threes, so even higher uh, actually the, the total population size. That's the that's the n, and also the number of unique categories that are already in the data. So that's of course the baseline that you have. Uh, you, you always hope that the lower bound won't be lower than than the baseline that you already have in your data. Um, it, it won't. Um, then there are some 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 nice visualizations that you can do just just to inspect the distribution of uh, of, of of your data, and especially important again are the, uh, the differences in distribution between F1 and F2. Most of the time, F1 is overrepresented, um, and and that's also what you hope, right? So that, that there's there's, a, there's just a smaller chance that you observe them, but there are, but they're just uh, that, that you observe them twice, uh, but there are of course many of those. Um, some nice ways of, of showing the distribution of that. Um, some sightings that's not, yeah, I want to go into the actual estimators. Um, so all the estimators are accessible through uh, an interface function and, and, and that's called the, the diversity function. Um, it, it essentially takes um, uh, one argument and that's just the, the count data that you, that you give it, the abundance data, and then you can specify different methods. Uh, so we only discussed the Chao one method, and I think that's that's the most reliable method that you can use, and also uh, the, the method that has been theoretically um, uh, studied studied best. Uh, but there are, are other um, estimators that have been discussed in the literature in the past. Well, it's it's an old topic actually, going back to Alan Turing. Um, so there is also the, the 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 jackknife estimator that you can use, and you can you can specify that in the diversity um, uh, method. Um, and there is another, yeah, there's an improved Chow one uh, method that sometimes actually improves your results, but not always. Um, the improvement should come from including higher order frequency items. So not just F1 and F2, but let's also look at F3 and F4 uh, to see if you can include a bit more of this. 
Poisson distribution that it, is, that it assumes. But the thing is, um, if your data, and especially our data in the humanities, um, doesn't follow the Poisson distribution closely, it doesn't really work. Uh, and if you include higher order items, that assumption will break sooner than if you just include F1 and F2. Because in, in that range, the, da the data is actually often Poisson uh, dist distributed. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You, you, can, you, can, you can have a look. And it's nice to have um, an overview of these different methods that you can actually compare them. And to me, and it, is, it also comes down to the same issue that I was discussing before, it, it, it's sometimes just hard to, to really trust the results, right? The trustworthiness of these results. How do we know? <laughs> Does this make any sense? Well, I, I got this, this number and now I should just trust this to be true or um, but here you just have different methods and again that's not that's not that's not uh, concluding evidence of course but if they're sort of in the same same ballpark uh, I think that's that that's very nice um, so here yeah that's just uh, the empirical of course that you can compare it to um, there are also some some bootstrap uh, methods here so so uh, allowing you to uh, compute the confidence intervals um, on the lower bound. So uh, that you should keep that in mind that the estimates and at, or at least the um, well theoretically it's only proved to be a lower bound the the estimated by Chao one so that's the theoretical benefit of actually using that model so the, all the other models cannot guarantee that the estimate that you get will in fact be a lower bound um, but applying the bootstrap to Chao one will then also guarantee that you get confidence intervals of that lower bound. Um, and it's theoretically, that's all very, very nice, of course. Um, so Mike already discussed the uh, minimum additional sampling methods that, that we use. So that's also implemented here. Um, and let me see um, the species accumulation curve. That might be a bit tricky um, actually to, to, to implement. And, and, and we provide some ways to, to, um, to, to quite conveniently plot that. Um, and it doesn't require much. You just need to compute this, this accumulation. And then you can actually use the uh, accumulation curve function to get this nice uh, looking graph um, with, the, uh, uh, with the empirical observation as this blue dot, uh, the, the interpolated uh, estimate and the extrapolated uh, estimate uh, of the curve uh, as it grows. So that's that's kind of nice, I think. Um, this is another plot where we combine this this minimum sample, uh, right? So Mike also showed that. Uh, so to, to to estimate where we're in fact where where this curve is is flattening in uh, flattening out, um, and and this this plot actually combines these these two views on on, on the data. Um, again, it's not much code. It, it's just relatively convenient uh, to to use. Um, this is yeah, some of the estimates. Let me see. Um, I think we don't really, we didn't really discuss that, right, Mike? The the hill numbers. Um, so in the in, in the original science paper, we use the concept of evenness a lot, uh, which is more about how the species are distributed uh, among the different frequency classes and. We say that, that a more even distribution actually could be beneficial to the survival of particular literatures. Um, and uh, the Hill numbers are, are, are just a fascinating way of representing uh, all kinds of entropy. Uh, and basically what they do is, is they, they, they show um, how you can, you can represent diversity on, 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 on all kinds of scales, uh, on the same scale for, for, on, with a different weight given to the frequency of, of items. So if you give uh, it zero weight, uh, essentially, um, you get uh, just the richness, just the unique number of, of items in, in, in a particular corpus. But if you uh, set that weight to, 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 to one, to the diversity order Q set to one, you get back the Shannon entropy, uh, which is kind of nice. And if you set it to two, I think you get Simpson's, uh, the inverse of the Simpson's diversity uh, uh, index, you get that back. So that's, that's kind of nice. And, um, the, that representation gives you a very um, uh, uh, detailed overview of the complete diversity that you have in a particular sample. And again, you can also apply the Chao-1 um, estimator to uh, those numbers and then get 
corrected or bias corrected estimates of, for example, the Shannon entropy uh, and bias corrected estimates of the Simpson uh, diversity index. And that's what this uh, plot is uh, showing uh, here. Um, so not much to do for you anymore. So that, that's 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 nice. Um, yeah, so we're currently adding more models. So as we progress in, in, in our endeavors to, to apply this to cultural data, more and more of these models uh, will, will, uh, will, uh, will be added to the, to the repository. Uh, now it's, it's only uh, essentially only um, Jiao one or the bear Jiao one model. Uh, I already started to include the, the, the model um, uh, that, that's specified for sampling without uh, replacement. And hopefully in the future, we will also provide a framework to, to do this generalized uh, child model. Uh, but we first need to publish uh, a bit more about that. Um, I think that's it for this package. Mike, do you have something to add? Otherwise, I think country forces are always welcome with every open yeah. source project. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been great and uh, such a rich presentation we went a little over but i just couldn't couldn't stop you because it was uh, it was very rich and really useful uh and we I saw some comments people who uh yeah thanked you um yeah great uh let me just stop the recording and then we can uh